Okay, welcome back everyone. In this screencast, I'm going to continue where we left off, looking at the solution of the Navier-Stokes equation applied to the problem of pressure-driven flow through a cylindrical pipe. And I'm working through the steps in my foolproof solution procedure, showing how they can be applied in the context of this problem. And so remember, we did steps one through four in the last screencast. Uh, step one was to choose a coordinate system. We chose cylindrical coordinates and we noted that we expect the velocity to be in the z direction along the axis of this pipe and that it's going to vary in the r direction from the walls to the center line. We know that it's pressure driven flow that's given in the problem statement and we've identified boundary conditions at the walls at r equals a the velocity is zero due to the no slip condition because those are stationary boundaries and along the center line we said that the velocity is finite and we'll talk more about that when we get to this point uh, in the problem and we've used our intuition to guess the form of the solution. We know that the velocity has to be zero at the walls and non-zero somewhere uh, in the interior. So we're postulating some shape uh, of this velocity distribution. And that the equation for the shape is what we want to obtain uh, by uh, solving uh, the equations of motion. And so now we can go on to step five, which is to simplify these conservation laws that we've already derived for the case of the problem at hand. And so we're going to start with conservation of mass. Remember this uh, in differential form we call sometimes the continuity equation. And I'm going to just uh, paste that here. And I've retyped this equation uh, myself. Uh, it's not reproduced uh, from a book. Uh, so there's no copyright issues here. Uh, but uh, probably if you're studying uh, for this course you, you can find uh, this equation in the table in your textbook. So this is an expression for conservation of mass in cylindrical coordinates and I've also listed up here in the corner uh, a summary of our insights about the velocity vector. Like we expect the velocity to be in the z direction only and it varies only in the r direction. So the strategy here when we evaluate these equations of motion is to go term by term and look at each term and remember what we expect about the characteristics of the velocity field and ask ourselves does this term contribute anything given the constraint that we've already imposed on the velocity field. So what does that mean? Well let's go through uh, term by term here. So the first one is a time derivative. So we have the partial of rho uh, with respect to time. This is a steady state problem. Uh, and a lot of the problems that we're going to look at, at least at first, are steady state. So if nothing's changing with time, then this time derivative goes to zero. So we can assume the problem is steady state, or we're going to assume that, so that we can ignore this first term in the conservation of mass. Now let's look at some of these other terms. So the second term we have a partial derivative with respect to r of rho r v sub r, and a partial derivative with respect to theta of rho v sub theta. Now notice what we said here. We said that the velocity is only in the z direction. So vr and v theta are zero. Therefore, any terms that contain these velocity components don't contribute anything because vr and v theta are zero. So therefore, these second and third terms of the equation are zero. Now let's look at the remaining term. We do have vz, but vz we said is only a function of r. And here we have a derivative of vz with respect to z. So since the z component of velocity is only a function of r, it has no, it's a constant with respect to z, so we get nothing when we take this partial derivative. So this term we can also ignore. So we just get that 0 equals 0. So this, this doesn't really tell us much useful, uh, but it does show that we are able to satisfy uh, conservation of mass uh, for the context of this problem. But in order to we, remember, we want to actually determine what this is. We want to determine this function vz sub r. So we don't have a lot of information from conservation of mass that's going to help us uh, make that determination. Okay, but that's not the only conservation law that, we, uh, that we've obtained. Remember that we also looked at conservation of momentum. And for the case of uh, incompressible uh, Newtonian fluid, uh, this is called the Navier-Stokes equation. And so remember, this is a, a complicated looking set of equations. So there's three components. 
And remember that here we're in cylindrical coordinates, so I'm showing here the r, theta, and z components. And again, I've retyped these myself, so they're not reproduced from any source. Uh, there's no copyright uh, infringement going on here. But if you're taking this class, uh, chances are these are uh, listed in the table somewhere in your textbook uh, in different coordinate systems. And remember, we already identified cylindrical coordinates, uh, so this is the and this is the corresponding form of the equations in cylindrical coordinates. So these are the r, theta, and z components of the conservation of mass. Okay, so again, let's go term by term, and we'll follow the same strategy and see uh, which of these terms actually contributes uh, to this problem. So again, just as we saw before, uh, we're at steady state in this problem. So any derivatives with respect to time don't contribute anything. So we can neglect all these time derivatives uh, in these, uh, in, these uh, in, in all of these uh, terms. Now I'm going to write up here again uh, what we postulated about the form of the velocity. Remember it's only we're only concerned with the z component of velocity and it's only a function of r. So let's go through this r component equation. So we have v sub r, v sub theta, v sub theta, v sub r, all of those are zero. We have a v sub z here in this term, but it's multiplied by a derivative of something containing v sub r. So none of these terms contribute. We have the pressure gradient in the r direction uh, minus partial of p with respect to r. I'm not, we're not sure about this one yet, so I'm just going to circle it. Uh, it's a pressure driven flow, so we can neg neglect gravity uh, in the context of this problem. And again, if we go through these terms on the right hand side, we have v sub r, v sub r, v sub theta and v sub r. We already said v sub r and v sub theta are zero, so none of these terms contributes anything. So all that we have left is this pressure gradient with respect to r is equal to zero. So this tells us, uh, in other words, that the pressure can't be a function of r, right? Because if we take the derivative of something that's not a function of r with respect to r, then we'll get zero. So that's essentially what this, uh, uh, what this is telling us. So this is the information we get from the r component equation. So now we can play the same game, uh, exactly the same game with the theta component. So again, we have on the left hand side mostly vr and v theta. The only place that we have a v sub z, it's multiplied by a derivative of v sub theta, which is constant with respect to z, uh, well, it's zero actually. So none of these terms on the left hand side contribute. We have this pressure gradient term that we're not sure about. It's a pressure driven flow, so we can neglect the gravitational term. And then again, on the right hand side, we have v theta, v theta, v r, and v theta, which we've said are zero uh, in the case of this problem. So none of these terms uh, contribute uh, in this brackets. So again, similarly to the r component, we get the partial derivative of p with respect to theta is zero. And again, from this, we can then conclude that the pressure cannot be a function of theta either. So there's no pressure gradients in the r or theta direction uh, based on uh, our analysis so far. Now let's take a look at the z component of the equation. So on the left hand side, again we have these two terms. One is multiplied by v sub r and one is multiplied by v sub theta, which we said are zero. Now this next term looks promising because we have vz and in both uh, in both terms, but notice here that this involves a partial derivative of vz with respect to z, and we said that vz is only a function of r. So the derivative of a function that's only a function of r with respect to z is zero. So again, this term doesn't contribute. So none of these terms on the left-hand side contribute. On the right-hand side, we have the pressure gradient term. We'll keep that, and we're considering pressure driven flow, so we'll neglect the gravity term. Now let's take a look at these terms uh, here on the right hand side. So the last two terms we have vz, but one is the derivative with respect to theta and one is a partial derivative with respect to z. And we said again that vz is only a function of r, so these terms don't contribute anything. And that leaves us with this term. So notice that we have a partial derivative with respect to r of r partial of vz with respect to r. vz is a function of r. We said that. So this term can have a value. It can contribute. So what we have left 
for the z component is this pressure term, partial derivative of p with respect to z, and this term from the right hand side, mu over r, partial with respect to r of r, partial of vz with respect to r. So this z component gives us a second order differential equation that we can solve. And we have two boundary conditions to help us with that solution. We know no slip at the walls at the r equals a, vz is zero. And at the center line we said that vz is finite. So even though the Navier-Stokes equations present us with this uh, intimidating looking collection of terms, when we look at the problem carefully and decide what are the most important components of the velocity field that are of interest in the context of our problem, then when we go through often we'll find that these equations simplify uh, quite a bit actually, as is the case here. Now another thing you might notice uh, also is that generally the most important term is the term of the equation involving the component of velocity, involving the flow direction. So notice we said that the flow was in the z direction and the z component of the Navier-Stokes equations is what yielded the main insight or the main terms that we'll use to evaluate the velocity field. So that's a general observation that you can apply uh, as a shortcut uh, in the future.